Garuda Indonesia flight 421 has just popped out the bottom of a massive thunderstorm. It has a dual engine failure and a total electrics failure. With the aircraft now gliding towards the ground, the pilots would have to do something amazing to save as much life as they could on this aircraft. Having spotted a river as the only place they could land, this air crash investigation will show you what happened in this extraordinary incident. This is the story of Garuda Indonesia Flight 421, a Boeing 737-300 flying from Ampinan to Yogyakarta, both in Indonesia. Apologies if I'm mispronouncing those town names. So the date was the 16th of January 2002, and on board the aircraft there were two pilots, four cabin crew and 54 passengers. They had a very experienced flight crew. The pilot in command was 44 years old, and had total flying hours of 14,020, with 5,086 hours on the Boeing 737. The first officer was 46 years old, and his total flying hours were 7,137, and it's not clear from the final report how many of those hours were on type on the Boeing 737. The weather at the time was fairly clear, with the temporary rain, showers and thunderstorms forecast between 9 and 12 UTC. There was no weather information provided to the crew for any significant weather on track for their routes they planned to fly. January is the peak season for thunderstorms in Indonesia and there was in fact a supercell on the scheduled route and this has its part to play in what happens next. So the crew taxied the aircraft and took off at 8.32 UTC and started their climb to 31,000 feet or flight level 310. The climb out was fairly uneventful, with the crew being handed from Bali Radar to Bali Center and then finally to Bali West, and given the squawk 4630. They reached their cruising altitude of flight level 310 at 846 UTC, which was 14 minutes after departure. The crew then started to state that they were observing cumulonimbus cloud formations on their weather radar, and they were coming up with a plan to avoid those systems. So what they were observing on their weather radar were two main red cells with a gap in between those two cells. But what they didn't know is they were falling foul to one of the main principles of the weather radar. And that's something called attenuation. So just so you understand how the weather radar works, it sends out an electromagnetic pulse. And then when it hits water vapor and water droplets, the energy is reflected back to the aircraft and the amount of energy that returns determines how much participation is there. And that will be shown to the pilots on their radar screen with colours showing you the density of the storms, with red being the most dense. Now because the system works on reflecting rain back to the aircraft, in some instances if the rain is so heavy, the radar can't penetrate that rain. So therefore behind that storm front, or storm system or cell, it will show that there's nothing behind it because no energy has been able to penetrate that storm and return to the aircraft from anything that was behind it. And that's called attenuation. So back to what the crew was looking at, they were looking at their weather radar and they had these two red cells with a nice gap in between them. Rather than flying around the storm, they decided that they can cut through the middle and avoid both of the main cells. The first officer then got in contact with Bali West and requested a heading change to 300 degrees. They were then instructed to leave flight level 310 to flight level 280 due to traffic that was flying at 290. Even as the crew were preparing to fly between the two storm cells, they still expected to experience quite a lot of turbulence. So they set their turbulence speed, which was 280 knots. They put the seatbelt sign on, engine ignitions were switched to flight and anti-ice was on. They then requested to descend to flight level 190. They were handed to Semarang approach and approved to descend to flight level 190. As the crew turned into their perceived gap on the weather radar, they then began to experience severe turbulence and heavy precipitation. Their weather radar now revealed that the area they were flying into was now completely covered in red, and in fact they were flying into the centre of that supercell. The sound now increased as the aircraft was battered with heavy rain and heavy hail, and the sky darkened as the aircraft continued to descend to flight level 190. The crew then lost some of their electrical systems and were confused to only have their primary engine instrument indications displaying. 
and after a little bit of troubleshooting, realised that they had lost both their generators on both their engines. And in fact, both the engines had flamed out, meaning that they had lost both their engines. The aircraft was now in a glide, still in the heavy precipitation, and the crew decided to carry out the emergency checklist, the loss of thrust on both engines procedure. This requires the crew to put the engine start switches to flight. The engine start levers both get put to cut off. And then once the temperature starts to decrease on the engines, they then bring both the start levers back to idle. So the crew attempts this in the first instance. One point to note for this situation, and it is written in the checklist, is that if the aircraft is in heavy pre precipitation, the engines are likely to accelerate to idle very, very slowly. So after the first attempt, the crew determines that it was unsuccessful and they wait one minute before attempting to restart the engines again. The crew run through the entire drill and unfortunately the engines do not start. At this point they're very aware they're running on battery power alone as they lost the generators from both their engines. So now they attempt to start the auxiliary power unit. The auxiliary power unit or APU is basically a small turbine engine that runs a generator and provides power to the rest of the aircraft. So as the crew run the procedure to start the APU, there is a total loss of electrical power to the aircraft. So at this point, the aircraft is still in the storm. It's still in the descent, currently in a glide with no electrical power. So none of the systems are working. There is no means of communicating in the outside world. The navigational systems are not working and it's up to the crew to come up with something to save everyone's lives. So as the aircraft continues its descent at 8,000 feet, the aircraft comes out of the bottom of the storm and is in fairly good weather and the visibility is good. The crew are then frantically looking for somewhere to land the aircraft. And it's at this point, the pilot in command spots the Bengawan Solo River. And without having any better options, the crew then decide that they're going to ditch the aircraft on the river. The crew then speak to one of the flight attendants and tell them to prepare the emergency landing procedure. The flight attendants then briefed and prepared the passengers whilst the flight crew were gliding towards the river. As they were planning to land on water, they decided to keep the gear up and the flaps up and to use the attitude of the aircraft to control their rate of descent and the aircraft speed. The flight attendant then informed the pilots that all the passengers had been briefed and the cabin was ready for their emergency landing. The pilots then continued to fly the wounded 737 trying to judge and ensure that the aircraft had enough speed and lift to reach the river, but not too much that it overflew the river and eventually had to land on the ground. With no means of contacting the outside world, the pilot ensured that his mobile phone was on him and prepped to go, and then turned all his focus to land in this aircraft as safely as possible. The aircraft impacted the river in the nose up position with the rear of the aircraft and the engines becoming damaged. The aircraft then slowed, ripping the right engine off and the left engine became slightly detached. The aircraft then came to a halt and settled down on its belly with the wings and control surfaces largely intact and partially submerged. The flight attendant then immediately began the evacuation. Due to the damage caused and the impacts, the only available exit was the forward service door and this was opened by the second flight attendant. As she opened the door, the slide inflated and eventually a local fisherman came to the assistance and started helping with the evacuation. Also, the villagers from around the accident site helped in the evacuation and they allowed the passengers and their belongings to be temporarily sheltered in an empty house near the river before then they could be taken to hospital. Out of the 60 people that were on board the plane, the 54 passengers and the six crew, there was one fatality, which was the flight attendant that was sat at the rear of the aircraft. There were also 13 serious injuries, but the remaining 46 people either had minor injuries or none at all. So although we've just seen what happened, understanding why it happened is just as interesting. And there were several factors in the background that led to this incident being more catastrophic than it needed to be. So as we discussed before, with the weather radar, the crew's understanding of what they were seeing was slightly warped. It's also noted that the tilt angle of the radar was set at zero degrees in their descent, which also means that they may have missed or cut off some of the readings that they were seeing due to the angle in which the radar was pointing. With regards to the engine flame out, 
it was determined that the, they both flamed out due to the excessive water hail ingestion. And this was way beyond the engine's certified capabilities. And when they tested the battery, which was the one thing that they were attempting to restart the engines and the APU with, it was found that one of the cells in the battery was lower in electrolyte than the others. And this meant that it caused insufficient storage of the electrical charge. It was also determined that the battery held 22 volts when it was supposed to have 24 volts, which may have assisted in the situation. And also, if the APU had been started before the engine restarts, it means that they would have had electrical power running through the generator of the APU, which would have assisted in restarting those engines. But even with all the circumstances that affected the flight crew, it was still an absolute miracle that they managed to take an aircraft that had a dual engine failure and a total loss of electrics and managed to land the aircraft on a river whilst keeping the fuselage intact and ensuring the safety of most of the souls on board. So what safety recommendations came as a result of this incident? It was recommended that the engine manufacturer should provide a procedure for in-flight engine relight whilst in precipitation. Also to provide a target airspeed in a dual engine restart procedure situation. A new training package should be created to train crews to understand the weather radar system in more detail. And it was also recommended that significant weather should be passed to air crews whilst they're en route and also to consider the provision of ground-based weather radars as this would also assist with reporting in real time to crews already in flight. This was a really fascinating incident with an unbelievable result. If you're interested in any other incidents like this, check out my air crash investigations playlist and if you want to be notified of any new videos coming out, please do consider subscribing. Thanks for watching this far and I'll see you guys in the next one.